Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you very much for the introduction, David. Um, of course, I have a challenge now to keep you guys awake. Uh, Where's now I've got to talk about finance. Now, we've heard this morning, um, you know, in Canada, they've got, you've got the opportunity to actually uh, have the user pay the charges. Uh, in the US, the airports are federally, federally funded. In India, you know, you have the ability to collect airport development charges. Even in Changi, Hong Kong, uh, you know, governments help fund airports. Uh, but we, um, in, <laughs> where we are in Malaysia, we're told what the charges are and this is how we got to operate. So a very challenging uh, environment for us uh, because we run all the airports in Malaysia. We're actually the first airport company that got listed in Asia and the sixth in the world. There's probably about 40 or 50 listed airports out there now. The, the, the funny thing is um, I decided to take my tie off on this one um, because most of the airport conferences I go to, uh, everybody's in, in a nice suit and tie. But the minute you go to a low-cost carrier conference, um, you know, everybody's in T-shirt and jeans and you know, every once in a while you see somebody wearing a red cap. Okay, now moving on. Um, so some disclaimer there. Okay, uh, of course, being a listed airport, we've got a, a primary stakeholder, our shareholders. So we'll touch a bit about our shareholder or stakeholder expectations. Some of the things that we have done to ensure that we can uh, manage better in difficult times, which is to focus on um, uh, the things that we have done in the past in terms of what we consider as structural or operational transformation initiatives. And, uh, and uh, therefore, some of the operational initiatives involves, of course, uh, enhancing revenue and reducing costs. And you got to do this uh, in order to manage yourselves better in the difficult times. And then ultimately, if you can do this well, you uh, will have all sorts of financing capabilities to help you build airports going forward. So this same principle actually applies not just to airports, but even to airlines and so on. So the question is, uh, in difficult times, what is it that you can, uh, you know, that, that you can do to make sure that you don't simply just survive, but actually thrive in the years ahead? Because there's a tendency that sometimes during difficult times, you just look at short term. You, you don't look beyond that short term horizon. You gotta look beyond uh, mid and longer term horizon. So it doesn't mean that in difficult times, um, you won't, uh, you know, organizations can go into difficulties. As a matter of fact, organizations can thrive during these times. And there are things that you need to do. Um, uh, some say you got to really take this time to focus on, uh, I would split it between external and internal factors. So external being, you got to try and really focus on your customer, your existing customers. Uh, and I think by looking at your existing customers, you, you can try to retain them and find ways to uh, perhaps even cross-sell or perhaps to try to deepen that relationship and engage into other business activities with your customers. You got to also look at uh, perhaps a different, a different strategy. Relook at your strategy in difficult times. Uh, in our case, for example, 10, 15 years ago, there were no low-cost carriers uh, and there were no plans. The airport master plan didn't have a plan for low-cost carriers, but things change. So therefore, we had to re-strategize and try to accommodate for low-cost carrier growth. Uh, so look at, look at new opportunities, look at new markets. You know, I just read something about Cathay Pacific now flying direct um, in, into different markets, into Düsseldorf, into some of the new cities in the US. So again, there are opportunities uh, perhaps in opening new markets uh, uh, or for that matter, uh, in opening new routes uh, and so on. Now, at the same time, that must be aligned to what you need to do internally naturally and this internally uh, you got to have the existing processes you got to have the the uh, a continuous improvement kind of mindset and uh, you got to be able to transform yourselves during these difficult times okay uh, so i mentioned there about cost reduction uh, opportunities as well now for us um, you've got not just the airline requirements to contend with 
It's funny in Malaysia, uh, you know, it, it, government, I don't know in uh, other countries, but in Malaysia, every single member of parliament probably believes they have a say in what you do uh, at the airport. So we have those challenges to contend with. Uh, we've got a, unfortunately I can't see, um, uh, we've got a, apart from shareholders and government, we've got the public to contend with and we've got our, um, uh, the airline partners as well as the, our tenants and so on at the airports and we got to make sure this myriad of expectations uh, align to our, uh, our strategies. So in our, uh, this is uh, just some of the example of some of the shareholders and commercial partners, government and the public uh, stakeholders that we have that we have to take care of. Now, what we had done, uh, I'll speak a bit about these two aspects of how, how we make sure that we can uh, manage better in, in, in difficult times. Uh, for us, when we got listed in 1999, you can imagine 1999 wasn't the best of times. Uh, so almost immediately after listing, we, you know, we didn't meet passenger numbers. Uh, 2001, you got the 9-11, and then you got the SARS event and so on. So, uh, but we, in terms of the structural transformation, we really had to re-strategize how we do things. And in particular, we looked at uh, the concession agreement that we had with the government. So I, I, we call this the structural transformation, which is looking, re-looking at the arrangement or the concession that we have with the government. Apart from that, the sustainable growth strategies is about uh, what we call, uh, what I call operational transformation. So naturally as an airport, we try to grow more and more of our revenue from commercial so that we don't charge as much to the airlines. Now, the, the, the structural part, and I think this is, this is, in my view, what has made us a, a very strong organization. Uh, being an organization that has a concession with the government, we are exposed to what we call regulatory risk. So one of the things that airports have to contend with, of course, oftentimes is, is the charges. And oftentimes you have to go to the government to get approval on the charges. Of course, in some instances in Australia and Canada, you can negotiate with the charges with the airlines and so on. But in our case, how the charges were looked at was simply um, how much does Changi charge? How much does Jakarta charge? How much? It's basically based on comparative or competitive forces. And uh, so within the concession, now it's very clear that, uh, that there's a certain benchmark rate that's determined in the concession agreement, and there's a framework for how that rate uh, is charged. So this, of course, helps, in our view, helps our airlines to uh, forecast going forward and that kind of thing in terms of how our charges are going to be set. So there's a proper framework for charges, not just passenger service charge, but landing, parking, and so on. The other um, major aspect of this structural transformation is, um, uh, is actually that there's a tendency that most airport companies tend to be majority government owned and so on. So in our case, 36% of our shareholding is by our sovereign fund, Kazana. And, uh, and there's another 15, 20% also owned by other government institutional funds and so on. So therefore, we are considered a government link company in Malaysia. And because you're government link, there's a tendency that your, your priorities have got to have some socioeconomic elements into it. Now, so, but we've introduced in the concession agreement uh, an item called marks. And this is uh, basically a situation whereby if the government wants to do certain initiatives that, for the purpose of the public or the community, then uh, that, that has burdened us as a commercial airport operator, we get compensation. So in situations whereby the government decides that the uh, landing charges, they want to help the airlines, uh, you know, or, or PSC, they want to help the, the public, uh, you know, the election is coming up, they don't want to increase PSC, so there are ways that we can get compensation from the government within the concession agreement. So these are very two key aspects of the, uh, what we call structural transformation of Malaysia airports. And this was done back in recently, actually in 2009, just about five years ago. Now, I need to mention this because as a, as a company, we've gone a long way to setting three major policies for us. And these three policies is that uh, the first one is in terms of dividends. 
Being a listed company, we've, over the last five, six, seven years, 50% of whatever we make goes to the government. This is on top of the user fee or rental fee that you have to pay to the government. So dividend-wise, 50% is paid out to, uh, to our shareholders. The second one is, so that, that takes care of the shareholders, and, and then you've got the credit rating agencies or, or the creditors. We have a policy that says we want to be a triple A company. And in Malaysia, we are a triple A company, a sovereign rating A minus Moody's. And, and what that means is we can't, we, we can't over leverage ourselves. We can't go beyond one time debt to EBITDA. Okay? And that decision actually helps ensure that even in difficult times, we're able to uh, deliver and we're able to thrive, as a matter of fact, because we don't over leverage ourselves and we make that a policy. And then you got. A, uh, there's a third one because this third one actually goes in line with our strategy. The third one is with regards to uh, whenever we embark on investment opportunities, we've got to have a return of at least about 15% IR. This is important for us because uh, I'll go into our strategies and that strategy talks about how um, we want to go international, we want to go beyond our borders. Okay, that, so this is effectively the, 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 the strategy. The first part of that strategy is uh, we focus on the terminal. We focus on the terminal by enhancing commercial space, by adding more shops, and you know, by, by making the environment within the terminal conducive for shopping. We've heard that uh, earlier today. The second part of the strategy moves outside the terminal. And we move outside the terminal by going into the land. Uh, the land, we're quite fortunate in the sense that um, 15, 20 years ago, the government decided the airport will be 60 kilometers away from the city, and therefore there's plenty of land that was allocated to us uh, to ensure that we can, we can uh, develop this side of the business. And then the third part of the strategy is actually going international. Now, I mentioned about how you want to focus on your customers, and this is what we did during the bad times. Um, in 2009-2011, we had introduced what we call an airline recovery program. You can imagine the, the, the bad years of 2008-2009. During these times, we decided to give back to the airlines. And we had a three-year uh, three airline recovery program that uh, in, in, it all adds together to about 160 million ringgit that we give back to the airlines as an incentive. Uh, so this, uh, for your information, this is uh, like 30-40% of our profits, uh, annual profits. And then we also, on top of the recovery program, we, when that ended in 2011, we continued with a airline incentive program. And that incentive program continues to incentivize airlines for growth. And again, you, if you look at that amount, it's about 250 million that we paid out over the last three years. So another substantial amount. On top of that, we had lending initiatives, uh, lending incentives. This is we worked very closely with the, with the government, pushing for incentives or lending, 50% uh, lending rebate to the airlines uh, back during the bad times from 2009 to 2011. So, and after that, the airlines, airlines recovered. And um, you know, we were happy to, to be there, supporting the airlines during these bad times, our customers, our partners. Despite the, bottoms, the bottom part of this slide, despite our charges, whether that be passenger service charge or landing and parking charges, being the lowest in the region. Okay? Now, so we, we, we looked at ways on not just um, uh, in the commercial part by enhancing revenue, but in terms of reducing costs. Uh, we had uh, invested significantly into our systems. Uh, for your information, we can produce our uh, month and numbers within three days. And we can produce our consolidated numbers within five days. And as a listed company, you've got to announce your results within 60 days, and we announce our results within 25 days. In, in Malaysia, most companies do their AGM. If you're December year end, you do your AGM in May or June. We do our AGM in March. So we focus on getting the information very quickly, very uh, out there, so that we can support our, our, um, 
our profit centers and subsidiaries and so on, and by providing them a man, uh, with a management dashboard. We also have a system whereby you can't spend if you don't have a budget. Uh, it, it's quite strict, uh, but it, it, it enforces discipline in the company. So apart from that, uh, I'll go into a bit of Kalai 2 and what we've done at Kalai 2 that helps us to reduce costs, apart from uh, the, the commercial part where we enhance revenue. So before I talk about uh, how we uh, had built Kalai 2, this is what we did in terms of our operational transformation or commercial transformation. We opened the airport Kalai A in particular in 1998, and then uh, this is at the main terminal um, the, the, for the full service carriers. In the, in the worst of times, in 2008, 2009, we decided to invest. And when we invested, we actually enhanced commercial space by about 30, 40%. We spent about 100 million ringgit, and doing that, we, uh, we subsequently were able to generate 70, 80 million revenue a year by investing during these bad times. And um, uh, so almost every time we enhance space and we add more space, open more shops, it's all fully taken up. It's almost 100% taken up uh, in terms of space at the airport. This is what we did at the full service carrier terminal. And then this is at Kalai too. I think we heard just now uh, from Changi uh, how about sometimes you can get instances whereby a low-cost carrier passenger will spend more than a, a, a full-service carrier passenger. And uh, uh, I, I would say we're pr probably pioneers in that in the sense that uh, in 2006 when we decided to open a low-cost carrier terminal and decided to bank on this business, low-cost carrier business, no one was investing in a low-cost carrier business 10 years ago. Now, we decided to do this not just to accommodate for uh, Asia, but we decided to do this because we looked at around the world. We looked at in the US, we saw the southwest of the world were growing and still growing and still growing market share and profitable. We looked at the Europe, in the Europe, and we saw the Ryanairs of the world. Not just are they profitable, but again, they're continuing, continue after 20, 30 years, continue to capture market share. And now market share for low-cost carriers in Europe is almost, I think, touching about 50%. So back then, this wasn't happening in our part of the world. So we, we, we gambled and we took this risk by investing in this business. We built a low-cost carrier terminal, the tin shed, uh, for, uh, and uh, for it was 10 million passengers. The space, commercial space was only about one and a half thousand square meters. There were only about 15 shops. But this business grew. Uh, the low-cost carrier passenger, uh, terminal passenger numbers uh, you know, touched 10 million passengers in just two years. We expanded it, increased commercial space, increased number of outlets. It, it, uh, it grew beyond that capacity in the following year. And we had no choice but decided to cater for an obvious growth that we are seeing in low-cost carrier business. So back in 2008, 2009, the planning started to build the new low-cost carrier terminal that was uh, uh, finally completed in May 2014, last year. And when it got completed, you can see that we enhanced the commercial space by uh, five, six times. We now have shops up to uh, about uh, almost 200 shops, and they're all fully taken up, okay? Not just we did that, we, we did something, we pioneered something very different as well. We actually have a shopping mall right in front of the terminal. And most airports do not dare to do this because they're afraid of cannibalization between, between uh, terminal and that shopping mall. But we decided to do this. And frankly, guys, uh, most of the time, we, we try to copy Singapore, what they do. But uh, this was, I think this is one instance whereby we see Singapore is doing a, a shopping mall as well in front of the, in front of the terminal that they have. Um, so we pioneered this concept uh, of having a shopping mall in front of the airport. And there's another 35,000 square meters of space, all basically almost fully taken up at this airport. The concept for this is, unlike in Asia, the reality is no mom and dad go to the airport without their children. No children go to the airport without their mom and dad. So the philosophy behind it is, as a passenger, you walk in and you do your shopping in the terminal. But as a non-passenger, now you have reasons to stay back. You can do your banking, you can do your uh, grocery shopping and things like that. So this is, this is the concept that we, we had built into when we uh, built the Kelai 2. 
So we've also gone beyond the terminal, and this is um, in May this year, we'll be opening, we partnered with Mitsui Factory, uh, factory uh, Mitsui Outlet to have the largest outlet in ASEAN. So we've gone into the land side and there's a lot of other initiatives that we have uh, that's going to the land side as well. So going to Kelai 2, this is what we did. Um, now, if you can, if you go in Changi or Kelai A, you got to go through uh, one screening, initial screening, and then before you board the aircraft, you have to do another screening. So that's double screening. That means more manpower and things like that. Uh, of course, in Changi's case, they, they don't have to bear the security cost, but we bear we, the security personnel is all ours. So in our case, at the main terminal, you have to go through this double screening, and you got to screen again every single gate. By the new airport, at Kalai 2, you don't have to do screening again before you enter the aircraft because we have a centralized screening. So that helps reduce our operational cost, labor in particular, considerably. Uh, other parts, uh, we decided to build a sky bridge. This focuses on the airline, of course. You don't need to do a U-turn. You can go underneath the, 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 the sky bridge. Together with that, we actually built a, a third runway. We're the only airport that has a third runway in this region and invested in uh, in a new air traffic control tower and equipment so that, so that we can uh, accept more frequency, air frequency um, at the airport. So we're, we're preparing ourselves for this. Um, uh, you know, apart from, I mentioned about the commercial space and so on. This is, uh, and, and building the terminal is quite funny because the airlines want something and that's the, on the left there, that's the list of what the airlines want. So they also want lounges, they also want um, a hotel and all kinds of things. Uh, we had a funny one with regards to that public request there in terms of Aerobridge. It was a, it was a big event in Malaysia. On one day you got the airline coming out to say we don't want Aerobridges. And then on, on the next day in the news everywhere, you got the, I, I think the wheelchair association or something insists on have, having aero bridges. So that was a, a difficult moment for us and a big uh, hoo-ha in, in, in the press in Malaysia. In the end, we had to build aero bridges. Uh, so these are some of the different requirements that, that uh, each stakeholder would have. And of course, naturally, we try our best to actually meet the requirements of, of uh, the airlines. Now, therefore, actually over the last few years, um, over the last 10 years as a matter of fact, our market cap grew from 500 million US dollars to now over 3 billion US dollars. We have provided about 750% return to our shareholders. And, and uh, you know, we've doubled, tripled, quadrupled our profits and so on. And after being able to do that, we now have the financing capabilities to look at all types of instruments. We can do debt, we can raise equity. Uh, we've even pioneered a, a, a new thing, in, in, which is the first uh, Sukuk, perpetual Sukuk rated program in the world. Uh, so this is where you can raise debt, but classify it as equity in your books. And uh, you know, some, these are some of the things that we've done uh, because we made ourselves stronger over the years, we, we are able to have a very strong financing capabilities and able to look at different uh, items. So as a conclusion, uh, naturally, I, I think financial leadership is required during all these difficult times. And as a CFO, we not just have to be, um, uh, play our traditional role as a custodian, uh, in terms of reporting, government rep uh, regulatory reporting, company reporting, and so on. We also have to uh, be pragmatic and be strategic and look at how investments can add value to the company. And naturally, lastly, and this is the most difficult part, is actually to, to be uh, a business partner to, to the rest of the organization. And this is the most challenging role because we, we, we have to not just be good at numbers, we've got to understand the business as well. So I end my slide then with this, um, with this thing. I think if, if we do the right thing, hopefully uh, one day, um, you know, uh, our market cap can be, uh, you know, your market cap can be 700 billion as well. I think this is the first company that reached their market cap of US dollars, uh, 700 billion. 
Uh, and this is basically because they continue to invest in, uh, in innovation and improvements uh, and evolving during challenging times and, and naturally, you know, in my view, you, you require strong financial leadership for that. Uh, we all know this company, right? No? It started at 10 US dollars, now they're 120 US dollars. They're the first company in the world that touched 700 billion US dollars market cap. Apple. Thanks.